thank you for joining us at St. James for a virtual worship. We're glad you're tuning in today. Just to remind you that today is Super Bowl of Caring and uh, contributions to St. James will go to ELCA World Hunger Appeal. You can donate online. Thanks for considering that. Please join me now in the confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Living God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace and in the renewal of our lives, make known your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, amen. The first reading is from the 17th chapter of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else. It is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain, and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins, then those who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for today is from Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, 
Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of the Lord praise to you, O Christ. A rich man was near death and was saddened because he had worked so hard for his money and he wanted to take it with him to heaven. So he began to pray that he might be able to take some of his wealth along. An angel heard his plea and appeared to him. Sorry, said the angel, but you can't take your wealth with you. The man implored the angel to speak to God to see if he might make an allowance. The man continued to pray that his wealth could follow him. The angel reappeared and informed the man that God had decided to allow him to take one suitcase with him. Overjoyed, the man got his largest suitcase, filled it with pure gold bars, and placed it beside his bed. Soon afterward, the man died and showed up at the gates of heaven to greet St. Peter. St. Peter, seeing his suitcase, said, Hold on, you can't bring that in here. The man explained to St. Peter, that he had permission and told him to verify his story with God. St. Peter checked and came back saying, you're right, you are allowed one carry-on bag, but I'm supposed to check its contents before letting it through. He opened the suitcase to inspect the worldly items that the man found too precious to leave behind and exclaimed, you brought pavement? So today we have a, a tough gospel lesson, a lesson that I'd rather not preach on. And this is good because we follow this lectionary. This lectionary is a three-year system that makes sure that we get all the important parts of the gospels and highlights from the Old Testament that correspond to that theme and also uh, lessons from the New Testament outside of the Gospels. We stand for the Gospel. The Gospel is important because Jesus is expressed in the Gospel lesson. So today we have this one, the Beatitudes of Luke, and unlike Matthew, this includes woes. Woe to you who are rich, Woe to you who are full. Woe to you who are laughing. Woe to you when all think well of you. As well as the corresponding blessings. Blessed are you who are poor. Uh, Luke here doesn't say, like Matthew, poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are weeping now. Blessed are you who are unpopular, who are hated, defamed, 
all these things. And it's, it's a tough gospel. It's tough for us, especially us who are rich, and I will consider myself being rich, would like to be richer, but it's hard to hear these words. And preachers have done things like, well, you know, I'll explain why you don't need to worry about that. Or, uh, or just don't do this gospel. I can guarantee you that in churches that don't follow this discipline of the lectionary, that this gospel never comes up. Because preachers think, well, I don't want to offend people. I don't want to lose anyone who has a lot of resources and who gives a lot to this church. So um, some preachers try to say, well, you know, I can explain this away. And other preachers might say, you know, I'm going to preach on the Corinthians lesson today, which I would love to do, where Paul is talking about resurrection and how we need to believe in the resurrection. But, you know, maybe we need to face this gospel for what it is. If I were preaching on 1 Corinthians, we would still hear the gospel, yes, and some would go away saying, those are really tough words. I guess they don't count. Should I not worry about that? Did Jesus not say that? Is that not important? So we need to face it. We need to take it as it is, at least for a moment. Now, I like all those things that Jesus says are woes. I like, as I said, I would like to be richer than I am. I like to be full and that uh, has proven trouble for me because a few years ago I was diagnosed with diabetes too and I've worked hard to take off weight and uh, so I'm back to pre-diabetic and uh, but I found out that being full and longing to have all those wonderful foods is not a good thing so was Jesus talking about that he says, woe to you who are laughing. Oh, come on, Jesus. Didn't you ever laugh? And he actually says, woe to you who, he says, blessed are you who weep and mourn because you will laugh. So laughing is not bad. Maybe sometimes there are people who cannot take anything seriously. They're so into making light of things, and those people are difficult to deal with sometimes, especially when there are choices to be made, tragic choices maybe, and those people can't settle down enough. They're too busy trying to take pleasure in things. And popular, that's a tough one for me. I like it when everybody speaks well of me, and. When I started being a pastor, I kind of thought, you know, I'm going to get everybody to like me, and I'm going to be good to everyone, I'm going to return their communication, and I'm going to be kind to everyone, and I thought, everybody's going to like me. And I found out soon that even if you do that, there are going to be some people who get upset with you because maybe you like someone else too much. I found out that that was impossible to be popular, to have everyone like you and speak well of you. Today's Old Testament lesson, the connection there is Jeremiah. Jeremiah, who I think wanted to be liked, he wanted to, he didn't want to offend people. And he ended up offending people because he had to speak the words of God. He said, when I hold it in, it's like a fire within my bones. I have to let it out. And then he was very unpopular. He spoke against the government of Judah and said, you know what? Judah is going to go into captivity. And Babylon is God's instrument to punish Judah. Not popular words. And there was, a, there was another prophet named Hananiah who was kind of like the yes man. And he said, ah, you know, Babylon, the, the yoke of Babylon is going to be broken and everything's going to be swell. Well, Jeremiah turned out to tell the truth and he paid for it. So Jesus relates that to the prophets. 
It says, blessed when people don't speak well of you, when they defame you, because that's what they did to the true prophets, and woe to you when everybody speaks well of you. That's what they did to the false prophets. So what do we do with this? It is, you know, it's, it's kind of a tough thing. It says, woe to you who are rich, who are rich because you have received your consolation. Now compare that to be, woe, uh, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. It almost implies that if you're rich, you are in danger of not going to heaven. Could that be true? Luke has an emphasis on the poor. And of course, really, if we look at the scriptures, one way to put it is there's a preferential option for the poor in the scriptures. Yes, I know. I know that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and Joseph, you know, the patriarchs, became very wealthy. It says that. And King David and King Solomon were very wealthy. So didn't God bless them? Of course, Solomon, of course, even though he was wealthy, he worshipped other gods besides Yahweh. He was not righteous in that way. And after that, the kings never uh, had that wonderful experience of being wealthy and, uh, and being righteous. It just didn't happen after that point. If you look at the New Testament, there's no way, no place that really blesses being rich. But instead says that this can be a danger. What's the danger? The danger, of course, is that we worship our wealth rather than worshiping God. I had a colleague, pastoral colleague, who talked about a congregation he was in, and um, he, was, he was a dynamite pastor, and worship was done beautifully in that church, just like it is here. And um, he had some people come up to him and say, this was in the city, in Hyde Park, and say, we really like church, Bob. We'd like to be here every Sunday this summer, but we've got this summer home, you know, we got, we got to use the summer home, you know. We, well, if you like church so much, maybe if you like being there, maybe we should just get rid of the summer home. And they had to serve the summer home because it was an expensive place, it was beautiful, and, and you know, had to keep it up. So there's a danger, I think, for we who are rich, who have a lot of possessions, to worship the wealth rather than the worship God. So, possessions, popularity, pleasure, these things can take us away from God. If we put our trust in possessions, if we put our trust in pleasure, in eating, in um, enjoying our appetites, we take our pleasure uh, in pleasure. We, we uh, you know, ha laughing, having a good time, being entertained, and finally, popularity, the four Ps that we must not serve. Of course, God in Jesus Christ came to save all people. And of course, there are, Jesus sits down and eats with rich people. And, but there, there should be, uh, I think, a tenuous feeling amongst us who are rich. You know, uh, we need to pay attention that we're not being dragged away from our faith in God by our wealth. And of course, what's the answer to that? It's stewardship. And I like talking about stewardship when it's not the stewardship drive in the fall. Stewardship means being generous. First of all, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement that every, everything comes from God. And that's tough. That's tough for some of us who are rich, because we like to think, I worked hard, and I planned my resources really well, and I invested well, and I deserve what I have, and that's not stewardship. Stewardship is an acknowledgement that everything comes from God, and that we are to steward, manage it, manage is another word for steward, manage it 
in such a way that others are blessed besides ourselves. So um, I think a faithful rich person is aware of his or her status and is careful, is very careful in being generous, in making sure that others are taken care of too. I think God doesn't like if there's wealth concentrated in one place and there's poverty in other places. So our job as a church, as a community of the faithful followers of Christ is to fight poverty everywhere. And one of the things we're doing this Sunday is, is the Super Bowl, the Super Giving, you know, the Super Bowl of Giving. It's a, a chance for us to support ELCA World Hunger, which is a really well-managed um, charity. You can trust that your money is going to go to those for whom help is needed. The good news is that God gives to us richly and grace is a rich thing that is given to us. And he gives of himself. That's the nature of our God. He gives of himself in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Apostle Paul says, who became for, poor for your sakes so that you might become rich. In other words, that we might take on Jesus' righteousness. As a response, we live generously. We give. We are careful not to, make, not to let our material possessions take us away from putting God in the center because God has put us, us human beings, in the center through Jesus Christ. So remember that whether you are rich or poor, that God gave Jesus for us and we are supposed to reflect that genera generosity outwards. Amen.
please join me in affirming our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that God has made. Blessed are those who trust in you. Strengthen the faith of those who profess your name and bring reassurance to those who doubt or fear. Through your church, speak continued blessing to the world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Those who trust in you are like trees planted by streams of water. Bless fruit trees with abundant harvest. Protect rainforests from destruction. Restore a land that has eroded after deforestation. Resurrect woodlands after forest fires. God of grace, hear our prayer. Search the hearts of those who govern, that they lead with humility. Inspire leaders to collaborate on policies that protect people and the planet. Sustain truth tellers and social movements that challenge society to become more honest and just. God of grace, hear our prayer. Send your blessings of mercy upon those who long for consolation. Tend to those struggling with poverty, unemployment, or uncertainty. Provide for all who are hungry. Console those who face persecution. Grant peace to all who suffer, especially those we name aloud or in our hearts. God of grace, hear our prayer. Renew this congregation in our shared mission. As we plan and dream for the future you are preparing, inspire us by the examples of Martin Luther and all the reformers. Bless new projects and new ministry partnerships. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for fellow members John, Kelly, Elijah and Jocelyn Duncombe, Craig and Ann Lynn, and Kirk and Mary Jane Walter. We thank you for them, and we ask your blessing on them. God of grace, hear our prayer. Christ is raised from the dead, and so we cling to the hope of the resurrection. We praise you for the lives of the saints who lived and died in the hope of eternal life with you. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord go before you to show you the way, beside you to be your friend, behind you to, to encourage you on, above you to watch over you, beneath you to uplift you, and within you to give you God's peace and the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.